So let's discuss secret sharing. It's a lovely primitive. It's an enabler of secure multi-party computation. That's the extension of the two-party secure computation we've seen to the case where there's more than two parties. But besides that, it's useful in its own right. And I think, in fact, its potential as a tool of direct use is underexploited at the moment. So when we discuss a secret sharing scheme, we'll usually parameterize it by integers t and n and talk of tn secret sharing. It's not the only type, but it's the most common and it's what's called threshold secret sharing. What a scheme for that allows uh, one to do is we start with one entity called a dealer who has a secret s, a string or a number or something like that. And the dealer splits this into shares these objects called shares have the following property. If you have any t plus one of them out of the n, there is a way for you to recover the original secret s. But if you have anything less than that, meaning you have some t shares or less than that, you won't learn any information about the secret. So effectively it provides privacy until enough shares are collected, at which point the secret is recoverable. Let's uh, cast it as a cryptographic primitive by giving some syntax. So a TN secret sharing scheme for us will be a pair of algorithms and they're called share and recover. You run share or the dealer runs share on input the secret that it wants to share. And it's a randomized algorithm and it'll output a list of n objects that are called the shares. We write each object as a pair of this form with the first component is the index or name of the player who is receiving the share in order to emphasize that we like as a kind of default to put the name of the player in the share itself. Now at recovery time some subset of the players as given by this set R, which is a subset of the one through N, want to recover the secret and they provide their shares. This is the shares of all these players in R. And the deterministic recovery algorithm will then tell them how to get back the secret. What it actually returns is a string or even it might reject, but we have a correctness condition that tells us that under certain conditions it will recover the secret. And those conditions pertain to the parameter t here, saying that it happens whenever this set has at least t plus 1 members. If we want to write that more precisely, generate the shares of an arbitrary secret in this way, take an arbitrary subset of players of size at least t plus 1, run recover on that set of players and their shares, and you will in fact get back the underlying secret. Now, as with many of our other schemes, there will be often an underlying message space, meaning secrets will be drawn from some subset of the set of all possible strings, and that factors into the correctness condition. We now turn to uh, formalizing the privacy requirement, and we can do that with the kind of language we've used before, which is games, even though historically in the context of secret sharing, that's an unusual way to be formalizing privacy. So having fixed our secret sharing scheme, uh, we define a game, which we simply call IND for indistinguishability. The initialized procedure picks our random challenge bit. And then as usual, there's a left or right procedure. What the adversary calls it with is two secrets, S0 and S1 of the same length. But it also supplies a set of players which must have size t. We could allow less than t, but without loss of generality, exactly t. And we think of these as the corrupted or bad players. So what does the game do? It mimics the dealer and creates a secret sharing, but it does that to the challenge secret, either S0 or S1, depending on the challenge bit that results in these n shares. Now it actually gives back to the adversary 
the shares of all the parties in this set. So these size of t, which is little t shares, go back to the adversary. And the expectation is that it doesn't help the adversary. When the adversary has called this procedure a few times, it can decide to output a guess as to the value of the challenge bit b, and the game returns true if its guess b prime is correct. We define the indistinguishability advantage of a, not as the probability that the game returns true, but as twice that minus one, because this is formulated in the usual guessing style. And as usual, the superscript is the name of the notion, subscript is the scheme, and the argument is the adversary. So a little more informally, what IND privacy says is that even if you know up to t out of the n shares of a secret, uh, that doesn't tell you anything useful about the original secret. Of course, we know that if you go to t plus 1 shares, correctness says you recover it. And this is saying that less than that is not sufficient. We often refer to that set t queried in LR as either the set of corrupted players or dishonest players, something like that. And its size is at most of a parameter t. Now, a lot of the examples in literature on secret sharing are focused on the particular case of what are called perfect schemes. And the scheme is perfect or has perfect privacy if adversaries in the above game have zero advantage. So they're completely unable to figure out anything about the challenge bit. This is unusual cryptographically because we don't usually have this kind of information theoretic security requirement or guarantee. But most secret sharing schemes are purely mathematical or information theoretic, and they will provide perfect privacy. So let's now give a couple of examples. So it turns out it's quite simple to give a secret sharing case scheme for the case where t, the number of bad parties, is n minus 1. What this means is that you need all n parties to get together to recover. t plus 1 equals n. But even if everything except one party get together, they will fail to compromise privacy. It's useful to parameterize the scheme by a group because we'll want in the end to look at it over various groups. So we fix a commutative group. We'll denote the group operation now by addition, not multiplication. And the inverse will now be denoted by subtraction. And that reflects the most common example, which is integers mod m, but the operation would be addition modulo m. Another example of such a group is the strings of length m with the addition being bitwise xor. How do we create the shares of a secret g? We create them so that this equation is true. We want the secret to be the sum of the n shares. The sum is taken over the group, so if you're in z mod m, implicitly there's a mod m being performed here. But also, the shares are random subject to this condition being true. That's for the privacy. How would we perform recovery? Quite simply, the equation tells us how to do it. If I give you all the shares, which is what happens when we are talking about t equals n minus 1, recovery means you have t plus 1 equals n shares, you just use this equation to recover s. What about privacy? Well, having picked the shares at random subject to this condition is effectively saying that if I give you all but one of them, you actually learn nothing about the secret because that last share is the um, thing you need to really put things together. So let's detail that a little by casting the scheme in our syntax. So again, we fix our community to group when plus or minus are its operations. And now we define the secret sharing scheme via algorithms. The sharing algorithm takes input a secret and the message space for that secret is the group. So we can share group elements. What it needs to do is to generate n, uh, secret, n shares, S1 through Sn, whose sum, remember, is the secret. And the way it'll do that specifically is it'll pick the first n minus one of them at random from the group 
and solve for the last one. So it, this setting Sn like this ensures that S is the sum of all the S sub i's. And that's the set of shares now returned. What about recover? When you give it a set R and the shares of the parties in R, it simply sums up all these shares and returns that as the candidate secret. So if you want to write it algorithmically, let S be zero. This is an additive group, so we'll denote the identity element by zero. And then one by one, just keep adding in the shares in here. All right, so our claim is that this is an n minus one n perfect secret sharing scheme. We won't formally prove that, but just um, informally correctness means we're concerned with t plus one, which is n shares. And we want to say that from those you recover the secret. So we're really just looking at this algorithm where R is the set of all um, the players. And indeed, if that's the case, then from this equation, we see that uh, this recovers the original secret. What about privacy? Well, at first glance, you might think there's something a little fishy here in the fact that n minus one of these choices are random, and then the last one is kind of structured and dependent on the secret. And you might think, well, the, the last share is somehow revealing information about the secret. But if you analyze the distribution of shares, it's not really true. What's really true is that any subset of n minus one of them are just uniformly and independently distributed group elements and carry no information about the secret. Okay, so our, that was our first scheme. What made this kind of simple was the fact that we, all the players get together for recovery. What's a little more difficult is when t is not equal to n minus one. And so you want a subset of players less than all the players to still be able to recover. And that's where Shamir's famous uh, scheme comes in. This scheme works over a finite field. Now, if you're not familiar with finite fields, you can either look it up or briefly and intuitively, it's something where you have both addition and multiplication. You have a finite set with a zero element and the set of non-zero elements is a multiplicative group whereas the whole set with the zero element is an additive group. We'll want the size of the field to be large enough that there's at least a point in it for each player. Examples of finite fields, the simplest one is just look at the integers modulo of prime p. We know that that's an additive group modulo p, and we also know that if we throw the zero away, leaving us with one through p minus one, that's zp star, and that's a multiplicative group in for multiplication mod p. And it turns out a few other properties that it's, it's a finite field. There are also uh, the Galois fields, which in particular can be defined to have order any power of two. And sometimes these are useful because then the group elements are strings. Now we'll fix um, some endpoints, distinct endpoints in the field. Think of these as kind of canonical basis elements. If you're in ZP, they're just one through N. But if you're in some more abstract field like this, well, you have to figure out some N distinct points to fix. Okay, so now we come to the scheme and Shamir's scheme will try to share a secret which is itself a field element. What the shelling algorithm will do is start by defining a univariate polynomial f of x. This polynomial has degree t, or a little more pedantically at most t, and its constant term is the secret. What are the other terms? The other coefficients of the polynomial are simply random field elements chosen by the dealer. So the polynomial looks like that. And you can evaluate this polynomial on any point in the field, and you'll get another field element as output. If you evaluate it on zero, notice that all this goes away and you get just get back s. So the polynomial has the property that f of zero is the secret. Now, what are the shares? Well, the share we'll give to player i is the value of the polynomial on the ith basis element. So I evaluate the polynomial on the e sub i, 
and provide that to player i. So we're going to claim that this is a perfect scheme for t out of n threshold secret sharing. And that uh, involves the following mathematical facts. The first one is the fact that any degree t polynomial is uniquely determined if I give you t plus 1 points on it. The most familiar case of this for us is that a line is determined by any two points on it, right, that we know from since high school. But that generalizes to higher degrees. And what that means is if t plus 1 players get together, their shares here uniquely determine the polynomial. Now that's the mathematical fact. There's still an algorithmic step which needs to tell us how they are to actually recover the polynomial and then by plugging in an input of zero, the secret. And we'll look at that in a little more detail with the polynomial interpolation algorithm. The privacy is going to be true because if you look at any t points on a degree t polynomial, they actually don't give you any information about the constant term of the polynomial because they're going to be uh, random and distinct. Uh, ra they're going to be random and uniform field elements. So um, let's now um, delve a little bit into the math. It's kind of, you know, quite elegant polynomial arithmetic and is worth knowing in its um, own right anyway. So let's associate to a list of t elements in the field the following polynomial or function, which on input x simply um, returns this sum. In other words, is defining a polynomial whose coefficients are the points in our list and the degree of this polynomial is t. Okay. So just a way of naming the polynomial through its coefficients. Now, let's say we have a subset of the points or of the players from our application perspective. And we're going to associate to that set and also to one member of that set a certain function. This is a function of one argument, mapping field elements to field elements, and it's given by this formula. So what is the formula? You take your argument x, subtract the jth basis element, divide by ei minus cj, multiply them all together, but you omit in the multiplication uh, this particular index. Now, before we go on to its properties, when we ask what all this stuff means, well, we're in a finite field. So any non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. So dividing here just means multiplying this field element by the inverse of this one. So effectively, this is just that in a finite field, all this stuff makes sense in the way you want it to make sense. Also, maybe worth noticing that this is itself a polynomial, and its degree will be one less than the size of r. So why is this function interesting? Because it has a kind of trigger property. Suppose I take some index in r, look at the corresponding basis point e sub l, and evaluate this function on that input. So now I have two indexes, l from the input and the i from the uh, description of the function over here. It turns out that this thing triggers in the sense that if i equals l, it'll output a 1, and otherwise it'll output a 0. It's kind of an indicator of whether l equals i. That's not so hard to see. Suppose l equals i and look at this product. Here we will have x equal e sub i. So we get e sub i minus e sub j divided by e sub i minus e sub j, which is 1. And so the product of 1s is 1. What if L is different from i? In this product, then, it's some j, because j covers every index except i. When you run through the product, at some point, x will equal L. Sorry, j will equal L, and so x will equal e sub j. But at that point here, you get e sub j minus e sub j, which is 0. So one term in the product is 0. But that makes the whole product 0. OK. Now we associate to this set of players also some field elements. So each one of them gets an s sub i, which is a, a field element. 
and I'm going to define a new function, also a polynomial, which is our interpolation polynomial, call it Q. It's associated to the sets R and S, and it's univariate as before. And here's the, the definition. What you do is you add up over all indexes in our set R, this value times the result of our indicator function on the set R and index I, and this x is just the argument, the same as over here. All right, well, that's some function. What do we want with it or what do we do with it? We might notice to start with that it's this polynomial of degree at more, uh, the size of r minus 1, because that's what the degree of these are. But what we're really interested in is this, that if you evaluate this, you remember you can plug in an x and evaluate it, on the lth basis point, it will give you back the corresponding output from here. So s sub i is a thing associated to i. So when i equals l, this should be s sub l. And this polynomial, when evaluated here, will just give you back that one thing. It's, again, not too hard to see. Why does it happen? Suppose I plug in x equals e sub l. So I have this whole sum over here, lots of terms. But the fact is, looking at these functions, they will be one when l equals i and otherwise just zero. So in fact, the sum is only one non-zero term and that's the lth term. And at that term, this is one. And so I just get s sub l as output. All right. So um, that sort of math, which may be a little tedious to wade through the notation, but it's uh, in the end fairly, fairly simple. And this is the result associated to it. The mathematical fact, again, is that a degree t polynomial is uniquely determined by t plus 1 points on it. But we need to go a little further and, and talk about the algorithmic recovery procedure for that polynomial given the t plus 1 points, and so that's what this formula is. So we fixed our finite field. We assumed it has size at least n plus 1 so that we can find n distinct points in it. Now, let's say we've picked some t plus 1 field elements and we specified the corresponding polynomial p as defined above. So remember, this just means that p of x is the summation of a sub i x to the i. We now evaluate that polynomial on our n basis points, and that gives us values we'll call the s sub i's, and these will be our shares in our secret sharing. Okay, now take some subset of the players which has size at least t plus 1. There are many possible subsets like that. We, we, any of them is allowed here. And also let s be all the uh, re polynomial results or shares, if you like, for those players. Once I have these two sets R and S as above, I can associate to them the polynomial Q. Right? Now, uh, this Q is a polynomial of degree t, because remember it has degree size of r minus 1. And this is the main claim. What it says is that this polynomial is actually identical to the one we started with. These are functionally the same polynomials. Okay. If that's true in particular, for any x that I plug in, these have the same output. So if I plug in a 0, I would get here QRS of 0, and here this P on 0. But P on 0 is just its constant term, which is A0. So I get this fact as a corollary. And this, these things together are going to be what allow recovery for secret sharing. We're not proving this, but an algebra textbook will, will give you a proof of this. So now let's um, specify Shamir's scheme a little more uh, detail. Uh, we've again fixed our finite field and those distinct endpoints, and we're going to give the algorithms for share and recover for our t out of n Shamir scheme. The sharing algorithm takes input a secret that's assumed to be a field element, and what it does now is it picks randomly from the field points to play the role of the coefficients other than the constant of, the, of a polynomial. 
And then we define this polynomial, which is P with the constant, with the uh, first coefficient set to our secret S and the other set here. So it's S plus A1X plus A2X, so and so, A2X squared and so forth. Having created the polynomial, we evaluate it on the basis points E sub i, and those results are our shares S sub i. And all those shares are returned as a list over here. So that sharing, when we come to recovery, we have here some set of size t plus 1 or more, and the shares of all the parties in that set. So um, we uh, let S be the, the, the shares, and then we consider our interpolation polynomial Q. So now thinking ahead to correctness, when the set R has size at least t plus 1, polynomial interpolation tells us that this Q will in fact exactly be this P. And so if I evaluate it at 0, I should get back the constant term here, S. So I do that and I return S. So the polynomial interpolation theorem gives us correctness. And what about privacy? Well, it, it needs to be proved, but it turns out that if you look at the results of this P on only T or less um, points, they will look random because of the fact that these coefficients here are all random.